Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for tonight, for the power that you've given to us, for the, the good internet connection that we can uh, meet and study. Father God, I pray in your grace, by your strength, that we can have a great class today, that the, the students will receive a new tool that they can use for studying your word so that they can apply it to their lives and also apply it to the lives of others. Also that they can uh, really understand more and more who you are, what your will is for us, and the end goal of this, Father God, is above all else that we would worship you. Father, we ask forgiveness of our sins. We don't deserve the position that you place us in. We come boldly before your throne through the blood of Jesus. Renew us again, guide us and strengthen us. Father, we pray for the ongoing COVID crisis around the world, that you would end it, that you would bring a resolution to this. And we also pray for stability around the world. We pray for the stability in the Philippines. We pray for the peace and success of the Philippine country. We also pray for the, the stability and peace of the U.S. Father God, I pray that our leaders would submit to your law and also seek to uphold true righteousness in accordance with what you've called all governments and people to do. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so... We are back, and we are moving on, and we're into session number nine. We're dealing with more structure, <laughs> more structure. Uh, and so maybe this is not your cup of tea. I don't want anyone to be stressed out. If this is very difficult for you to understand, I know that for the most part, those who are present are, are, are probably good at this, but maybe you're watching this delayed or through Facebook Live. If you're not so good at structure analysis, don't worry, you will not fail the class, okay? So the assignment that I will give out tonight for next week, we'll be, do, we'll be practicing these things. And whenever you practice riding a bike, you're gonna fall and get your knees skinned up, but you will not die <laughs> unless you go down a big jump. So what I wanna say is that I don't want anyone to have fear. I don't want anyone to be afraid you know this might seem overwhelming but at the same time it's a tool and so i would I'm, i hope that if, if all else the hermeneutics this class is really opening doors it's opening doors to you it's opening uh giving you knowledge so that you can say wow there's so many different ways that i can study the word of god and we don't we don't do it all at one time we can't do it all at one time, but we're, we're really opening new avenues, new platforms, and we're al allowing you to, to go deep as you want to go. Really, I heard one person say that some people, they only have a limited number. A leader or a teacher only has a limited number of lessons, and then once they really complete that, they want to move on to another church because they run out of things to do or say. And I want to say that <laughs> I hope this class will show you that it's not the case. I mean, from my perspective, I, I think about, wow, I, there's so much information. There's so many different ways I can go. I don't have enough time as opposed to I'm running out of things to do and say. So I really hope that this can just be just opening doors for you and, and not to be stressed. So tonight, we're last two, actually last two weeks, we had last week was a vacation, but the pr previous two weeks, we looked at intra-sentence, and we'll, we'll discuss that intra-sentence tonight in session number nine. We're continuing our structure analysis, and we're looking now at inter-sentence analysis, inter-sentence analysis. So we'll look at what that is, and especially this is really designed for epistolary genre analysis. And so uh, Sunny, uh, Sunny had asked, Sunny had asked before about some of these tools and methods and so uh, really we are now uh, in that we are now in this area of the next uh, three weeks more at least we're going to be really giving you different tools to really go deep in in poetry in narrative and also in epistolary so tonight we're focusing on epistolary genre analysis and you could apply this in other genres or other structures, although sometimes it will not work. 
So, so uh, just to be aware of that, this is really designed for epistolary or discourse because in, in the Gospels, you can apply this analysis in Jesus' teachings as well. Um, it, it, it could work in narrative, but there's really a different method for narrative. And, and we'll show it to you. So, okay, just overview really quick. We have a handout. So I emailed and I also sent a, in Facebook groups a handout. Uh, and the handout is discussing types of sentences and relationship between sentences. So that's it. It's, it's not so big. Uh, so we will discuss this handout. And then we're, we will apply it to Romans 1, 16 and 17. And then we're going to try to practice it. So I plan to have a breakout session. That's why I sent you the worksheet. I want you to practice this. I want you to practice this together. So we only have, oh, we have, oh, we, okay, we have some. We have, we have maybe six. How many participants now do we have? We have uh, at least uh, seven, so, so it's possible. So we will break out, and I want you to practice what we learned, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll also work on it together. So, uh, so you've already seen intra-sentence analysis. Intra-sentence is within the sentence, so we're looking at different components of the sentence, different significances within the sentence that, that we will identify so that we can really draw out theological truths and then also then be able to apply it. And so we've completed that, or at least I shouldn't say completed that, we've given you an introduction. And maybe in future courses when I teach it, I'll say an introduction to intersentence analysis, an introduction to intersentence, so that you're not thinking it's, uh, it's really just opening the door, it's beginning the process. So then the second is intersentence analysis, and really, uh, you could also say epistolary genre analysis because the two are really connected. The, the, the types of relationships are really, you would really use them in when you're analyzing, analyzing epistles. Okay, moving on here. We also will, so I, this, is, this is just a big picture of structure analysis. So we've already done intra, now we're focusing on inter, inter sentence, and then for Narrative and poetic genre, there's, there's two other methods. So they're similar. You, you'll see that they're similar. So uh, don't, be, don't be stressed about that. And actually, in some ways, I combine several of these when I'm in like poetry or you're in the prophets. So there's overlap between these analysis, uh, 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 analyses. Uh, and the reason for still having different ones is because sometimes it doesn't work. And so you, you can't, because there's different structures, uh, again, genre refers to structure, because there's different structures and characteristics of, of the text, of what's writing, uh, just having one specific analysis will be, will, it will fall short, it will be deficient. So uh, again, that's why we have these different tools that we'll be giving to you. And I, I, I just really want to emphasize again, when I'm, when I'm teaching, when I'm preaching, I might not always use these because I don't have time. But again, if you have, if you have the time, um, you have at least, I'm giving you the, the different tools that I hope that you will store in your bodega for, for when you want to use them. Okay, for when you want to use them. All right, let me see here. Okay, so let's go ahead at this point, we're gonna to go to the handout that I sent. So now we're on to inter-sentence analysis or epistolary genre analysis, okay? So this is, the second part of our analysis. And um, just coming down here, again, the handout that I sent you, the PDF, has these quick links so you can look at all the different types. And so you, if you don't want to actually, if you don't want to actually go, you're, already, you're just using this for different categories as you work through the text, you can quick, you can, you can tap it. So I, I can tap here and it goes right to the example. So, just like the other handouts I sent out, you have this, these quick links here. So this is an overview of all the different types of sentences that you have. So there's a lot of different sentences here. There's a lot of different sentences here. And just looking from a big perspective, you can really see how in some ways this is very important. And, and some of us do this naturally. So we shouldn't be stressed. Well, I've, I've heard many people preach here in Tak Loban. I've heard some of you preach. And, and so I've heard, I've heard people use these type of, of, of uh, uh, sentence references in your preaching. So I don't want you to be uh, thinking that this is 
so radical, radical or, or unfamiliar to you. But just looking at a big overview of the different types of sentences, imagine how many different types of sentences we have. And, and there could be more. So you have action, you have an assertion, you have a beatitude, you have a benediction, command, conclusion, description, you have doxology, exclamation, a knowledge sentence, a possession, so the sentence describes what is possessed. You have a prohibition, you have a prophetic declaration, or what some people would say prophetic pronouncement, proposition, rhetorical question, salutation, uh, setting, state, statement, and warning. So there's just a host of different types of sentences. And so the importance for us is when we're preaching or we're teaching, sometimes it's not significant, many times it is. Identifying the type of sentence in a passage of scripture is very important uh, for us. The, um, especially for identifying significances and theological truths by which we then not only maybe believe, but also um, practice. The one thing I want to say is this list is not comprehensive. This list is not comprehensive. So perhaps you would want to say, ah, or in your study, there's a, there's a type that's not present here. Email me if you think there is one and we can add it to the list. So the, this is from me thinking through the process and coming up, but there could be more that I have not included here, okay? And then, so these are types of sentences. And then below here, we have sentence relationships. So not only do we have types of sentences, but now we're looking at relationships between sentences. And so we'll, we'll, we'll work through these. Before we get into the specific examples, I have a big picture, a big picture for you. So essentially, we can just say here, intersentence is dealing with uh, relationships between sentences. So we could say relationships, or we could also use the idea of uh, correlation. Or perhaps a connection. Every sentence is related in some way. Okay. Uh, so just a big picture here. So I gave, if you recall, I gave the, the picture before. If you can, I'm just going to highlight this. If you can imagine, this is, you've already seen You've already seen this going side by side, okay, in the intersentence relationships, okay? So I am now just, I'm, we're just now expanding to give you a bird's eye view, okay? So you can, you can look at these basically as a sentence, okay? And then you're going to have, if you can recall from that other, that other diagram, these are connected by a connecting word, okay? And so then that connecting word is going to give us an intersentence relationship. Okay. Now I do want to say this. There are two ways to make this relationship. And maybe I'll add it in a second edition or revised edition. The two ways are by um, number one, by form. Number two, by logic when we're making this relationship, okay? So when we say we can, I, we can make a connection between a sentence by form, we're, we're looking at the specific connecting word. Okay? If we're saying by logic, we're simply saying, uh, what is the logical relationship? There is no connecting word. But, but it doesn't mean that a relationship doesn't exist. Do you see that? So oftentimes there is still a relationship even if a connecting word isn't used. In English, we typically, my speech right now, 
I have used, but if you were to, if you were to record what I'm saying, type it out, put periods, each sentence that I begin with, I'm not beginning it with a connecting word, right? I'm just going sentence by sentence describing to you, but there is a logical connection in my speech. In Greek and Hebrew, there's a lot more connecting words. So Hebrew and Greek, there's a lot more, there's a lot more of this. In English, in English speech, there's more, it's more logic based. There is no explicit connection. Okay. Sometimes you have that in Tagalog, sometimes not. You're, if the person's always saying tapos, 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 and then, right, and then, and then, and then, right? Uh, they're making connections between sentences using the, the connecting word tapos, okay? <laughs> There's jokes in the U.S. where someone who's a foreign speaker comes into an English, and then they're always using a connecting word, and it doesn't sound right, because English does not really use a, we don't, typically begin our sentences with a connecting word unless there is a very strong and clear connection. So we could say therefore, so, okay? We can use those, but those are not as common, all right? Is everyone tracking? Let me just take a minute to pause. Good. So we, we can, the big takeaway here is that in looking at relationships by form or by logic, I really want us to see that, okay? And if you can imagine here, if you can imagine here, just imagine here for a second, right? Um, you, have, you have two sentences, one, two, you have uh, one relationship, and then you have multiple parts. So you can have, right, an out, you, you automatically see an outline forming. So what I want us to see here is you might be stressed in seeing this. You might be stressed. You might be like, wow, this is, do we need this, Tim? And my answer is, yes, we need this. And the reason why we need this is because you would not, you would not believe how many times people ask me to help them form their outline for their sermon. <laughs> and so what I'll typically do is they have a text and they say, Tim, how can I do this outline? I will go and do this method on the passage of scripture. And then that's how I'm forming the outline that I recommend to you. <laughs> so is there work? Yes. But the benefit is that, is that it's, it's, not, it's not like you're just, okay, how do I come up with this outline? And you're just thinking, thinking, thinking. There is a logic, there is a structure to the outline that you will form, and the structure is found in the text, okay? And so literally we can say it's a text-based outline. It's, <laughs> it's an exegetical-based outline. It's not an eisegetical. Eisegetical is you're putting stuff in. Eisegesis, you're putting it in. You're coming up with, uh, from your mind, you're coming up with the outline. Here we're saying that types of sentence, types of sentences, now, before we begin, I also want to say you're going to see a lot of connections and parallel ideas with our types of verbs, okay? That's, that's not a coincidence. The verb is, a, is the most foundational part of a sentence. In some sentences, a verb itself is a, an independent thought. That's true in Tagalog. That's true in English. That's also true in Greek and Hebrew, okay? So the most foundational important word in a sentence is, is typically the verb, okay? It's not coincidence, it's not, a, it's not a random chance that the types of sentences, you're gonna have overlap between verbs and the sentence itself, okay? So a sentence is, a, is an independent or complete thought, statement, or idea. So a sentence is this independent idea, thought, or idea uh, or statement. In identifying types of sentences, the exegete is identifying the fundamental idea that the sentence is conveying. So a sentence can, can, can be a compound sentence, it can be a complex sentence, there can be a lot of different parts of the sentence, but at the end of the day, what is the fundamental function, what is the fundamental type 
of sentence that is, that is there that you're identifying, okay? There are many components of a sentence. In this part of the process, the interpreter is to take a step back. You did an intra, so you really look close. You, you, you took the magnifying glass and you went really deep. Uh, in this stage, you're gonna take a step back and say, okay, I've broken out this sentence. I looked at this sentence. What is this fundamental idea? What is the sentence conveying fundamentally, okay? What is the primary function of the sentence? So we can say, what is the sentence and what is its primary function, okay? So now we have types of sentences, types of sentences. So you're gonna see, you're gonna see a lot of parallels here now with, with, um, with verbal ideas. So number one, action. <laughs> so we have an action verb that, translate in, that translates into an action statement. So I have an identification there for action. You have a symbol act. You're using green, not red, because you're looking at the sentence as a whole. So definition, this is a statement that describes an action or event that occurred. It is very common in narrative discourse, multiple, uh, multiple events linked to form a scene. So an action, it's, it's an action. It's very, it's, it's something that is done to something else or, or to someone, some person or something. So he called his name Jesus. What type of sentence is it? It's an action sentence. It's describing an action. Number two, assertion. Number two, assertion. Assertion is uh, the statement of a fact or reality. It may or may not need support or validation. Typically, this is the most foundational expression for argument or discourse. Okay? So an assertion, uh, maybe it necessitates a question, maybe it necessitates a response, but it doesn't have to. God is a Trinitarian God. That's an assertion, right? Now, you, maybe you'd want to say, okay, prove it, Tim. Okay, so, so that, that's, where, that's where there's a need to, to offer validation, all right? So this is, where, this is where law comes in. So Chloe Bullboy's here, maybe Alex is here, right? So someone can make an assertion and they would, the response would be, you know, you need proof or that's inappropriate, right? Because it's just a statement without without a basis, right, Koya Boboy? So, so sometimes, sometimes assertions are typically viewed negatively until there's a proof offered. But that's not always the case in the biblical scripture. If God is speaking and he makes a statement, there is no need to back it up. It is what it is. It stands, right? I am the Lord. <laughs> there is none like me. There is no need. That, that's a statement from God of who he is, and that's it. Now, the fool will say, where's the proof? But from a, from a believer perspective, it, it stands as it stands. It stands by, its, by itself. Next we have is a beatitude. So beatitude, uh, this is a blessing or statement that is aimed at a person, group, or people. Okay? Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and to keep what is written in it for the time is near. So this is from Revelation. And so very profound statement. Uh, but it's a beatitude. There's, there's a blessing being conveyed to the, per, to the people who are being described. Now I have separated beatitude from benediction because benediction is focused upon God. Beatitude can be focused upon us. So, so, because the, the, the next statement that we're going to discuss is benediction, and the question is going to be, well, what's the difference between the two? So beatitude is always geared towards individuals, towards nations, towards create, creation. Benediction will be geared or focused upon the creator. So we have next, benediction. Ha! This is a statement that attributes a blessing to a person. In all cases, these statements are directed at God generally or one of the persons of the trinity specifically so this is a benediction so blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ and, and typically the, the 
Ephesians 1, 3 continues and describes why there's a blessing. But here the focus is just upon uh, blessing. So uh, the, the, the practical, the practical here is that uh, we don't do this. I stand guilty. I raise my hand. I'm not as, as I, I'm guilt. I want to improve in this area. But we need, when we make our prayers, our prayers are focused more on asking requests from God. We, we don't offer, we don't bless his name. We don't bless him. And so we need to pray with more uh, benedictions in our prayers. And so I, I am also guilty of this. So I am not pointing any fingers at anyone. Uh, next we have is a command. And so a command that would, would just be like uh, what we have in um, the verb. So look at the example here. If any of you, this is a, This should be James. Is this James 1, 5? Someone correct me. Maybe Sonny can correct me. I think they're studying James 1. I think it's James 1, 5. I could be mistaken. If uh, yes, any, that's correct. Okay, good. <laughs> so, James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach. So you could say, wow, Tim, there's different components there. How did you choose this idea of command? And so let's just look at the different components, okay? Really quick, I'm going to highlight the different components. Number one you have here. So you have this component, and this is a, this is a condition. All right, and then you have this component here, and this is a description. It's describing God, and we know that because of this connecting word, who. So. Who is God? Who is this God that we're going to be asking? It's he's the one who generously gives without reproach, right? But there's a condition. And then the main, the main idea here is this command. The actor is the one who uh, lacks wisdom. And the object is, of course, God. All right? So I could preach. I could preach. I could preach this one verse here. It would be short, maybe a devotional. But you have here the fundamental idea. Everyone can see it. With, with, if, you if, if, you, if you take out... Um, uh, uh, if, you, if you take out, the question is, if you take out, what part do you take out that totally uh, the whole thing falls down? So what's the most fu fundamental? So imagine here, just really quick, if you can imagine. You have a building here, right? What? What's the one thing you can take out that would cause the whole building to fail, right? That would be the foundation. You take out a foundation, the whole thing collapses, okay? So my question is always, when you're looking at this, the, the comprehensive idea, what, what is the most foundational idea and how does it relate, okay? So the most foundational idea here is this command, all right? The command, so you could say uh, you have a command. Um, the command is to let him ask of God, and then you can have, you can have a, um, you could you could describe the command if you wanted to. You could describe the person or condition. 
and then C, you can describe God. All right. All I want to emphasize is that the most important component is here, is this let him ask God. And then you have, you have a connection in the condition. So not everyone's to ask God. It's, it's only those who are lacking in wisdom that are to ask God. And who is the God that you're asking? He is the one who gives generously without reproach. Okay. Any questions or comments, or is everyone tracking with how I came up with that? Because this, this is a comp, this would be, this would be an example. This would be a, an example of a, of a, a, a calm, a complex sentence. Okay. This is a simple sentence here. This for sure is a simple sentence. There's only one clearly idea. Here you have, you have three parts. One, two, three, with, with this being most important. Let me just take a step here. I don't want to stress people out. So, so Tim, most likely the, the verb is the, is, is the main point of, of the sentence or, or the, the, the arguments. I say that. I would say the arguments of, for example, James. And then all those, all those um, is that a subordinate clause or subordinate clause, I think? Uh, yeah. Are they support, are the support for, of, of, the, of that main verb, which yeah. is the main, the, main, the main point of, of the argument. No, excellent point. Excellent point, Sonny. So Sonny is very much correct. The other two, so this is a, uh, this, this is a subordinate clause. If we're talking in grammar, subordinate, this is also, this is also subordinate. And then this here, this can stand alone. So grammatically, yeah, absolutely, Sonny. Again, the requirement is you don't have to know grammar, okay? The grammar helps, but, but logically, we can also come to this conclusion, okay? You ask, what is the sentence? What is, what is the part of the sentence that if you remove the rest, it can still stand alone? If I remove, let him ask of God who gives gener generously without reproach, if any of you lacks wisdom, is incomplete. It's incomplete. It cannot stand alone. Who gives generously to all without reproach? It's incomplete. You cannot have your own sentence. Okay? So logically, we can see that. Now, of course, grammatically, there's a reason for that because, of the, because it's a dependent clause, a subordinate clause, because of the, the subordinate conjunction. So there's a grammatical reasons, but you don't have to know that if you don't know grammar. Again, it's, I'm giving you a logical reason. Okay? Great, great comment, Sonny. I appreciate that. Excellent, excellent work. Anyone else want to add? And we reward that verse 5. Reward. Go ahead, try. Uh, rearrange the word in the verse. So, so it depends on the purpose. If you're rewording it so that so that it's, it's clear, it's more clear, or you're explaining it. Part of commentary, part of exposition is that you, you are going to reword, not to change the meaning, but to make it more clear, okay? So in your time of explaining, I would encourage you to reword and practice rewording it. If you can reword it and it's accurate, then, then we can say that, wow, the person has or you have a clear grasp on what the word is teaching, okay? So that is appropriate. If you're rewording it to tone it down or to change the meaning, uh, you should not. <laughs> but sometimes that's, that's helpful to reword. So, Sir Tim, if I'm going to build, I mean, in my, in my own, uh, you know, under summary understanding of, of this topic, uh, I have to, to look at for to look for 
I mean to look for the main clause uh, in order to draw the ma main uh, points of, of the text and use the subordinate clause as the support system or, or the sub points that yeah. support those main clause. Yes. Uh, yeah. is, that, is that correct? Yes, excellent. Excellent, that's exactly right. And we will actually later practice that. So we're going to practice that just briefly. Um, but yes, your main, the main clause, the main verb should form your main driving point. Excellent, excellent statement, Sonny, yeah. So that's our goal, okay? Great. Let's, let's move on, let's move on here, okay? So uh, a conclusion, this is, a, a, this is in a series of propositions that's moving towards a climax. Uh, it's very close to an inference, but slightly different in that there, in a conclusion, there typically isn't a conjunction, like a therefore, number one. And number two, uh, therefore is typically, uh, therefore is moving into another, the effect of something, whereas a conclusion is just bringing a series to a climax, okay? So conclusion and inference are close. We'll look at inference in a bit, but um, uh, um, it, it, they are different, okay? And so the example here is, I would just encourage you to look at James chapter one through, uh, or I think James six, James one, six to 11. It's moving, it's describing the flower of the field. And then the conclusion is that the rich man will fade away just like the flower, okay? So uh, if you wanna look, I would say look at the broader context uh, in your own time if you want to study the example. But we can say here that so also the rich man will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. That's a conclusion to a, a description of a series of events in the life of the flower. And then there's this comparison. And, and I, I also want to say is that there is debate. Some people will say, well, it's not a conclusion. It's a, it's a comparison or it's a, fair enough. Again, I, I just want to take one more step back that these are helpful in trying to develop relationships, but it's not black and white all the time because it's not like the, the writer is thinking like, okay, I want to choose a conclusion. Now I'm going to choose a description. We just don't, that's not how we work. These are just tools to help us analyze what, what speech, what language is, 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 is doing. Okay. So it, it's not, it's not a black and white issue, okay? All right, description. Description is a simple, this is just a statement describing. Tim, you, Tim before we proceed, can, we, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Uh, in your definition of conclusion, can you state the definition without using the word conclusion? So we will not be confused oh, by the definition and the third, because the definition, this is a conclusion in a series of propositions. What is the best word for conclusion here in the definition instead of using conclusion because you are defining the word conclusion so what would be the i'm sorry you know this was my first edit i apologize climax this is a climax okay. so climax, climax. sorry <laughs> no, no, I, that's yeah no i appreciate Corey Bobo, i appreciate that i'm embarrassed <laughs> oh my goodness no it's good that's good Okay, so thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Good catch. No, that's, that's good. We should not have it in the sentence. I agree with that, that definition. So think about climax. Think about climax. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. can, can I further ask the can I further ask uh, Tim? Because you use the word climax. Because when you use climax, we are thinking of the high point of the sentence. So what are you referring to when you say the climax of the of the sentence? Because conclusion could be the result or could be the end. That's that's what you usually in your mind when, the, so, when you when you get a conclusion. It's usually the end, not necessarily the climax. Sometimes the climax is not not the end. Fair enough. Fair enough. So let's do this. This is a climax. Let's do climax. Let, let's let's do this here. Climax or resolution. Because you are correct, Koyo Boboy, in narrative, 
in narrative, the climax is not the conclusion, but in a series of propositional arguments, it is. <laughs> so, so it just depends. So let's do climax or resolution, okay? Well, no, that's really good because here's something to think about. This is something to think about, especially, especially in, so, uh, uh, the framework of the Bible, the framework by which God has created order the word, world is in a covenant framework, and the covenant is in this, is in this uh, judicial courtroom setting. That's the setting of, of creation. God is the king, he's the judge, and so everything is ordered around that. So we, we should expect that. That's actually a huge... Uh, thought that that's making me think so even with with the apostle paul a lot of the letters there's a lot of judicial language because that's how god has ordered it it's really it's really pr profound it's a great observation for you yeah so take that. that's why you ever notice henry when we file pleadings in court we usually caption it as petition yeah. And this is very similar to the petition that is found in the Old Testament. You petition God, you petition etc. This is uh, this is the same uh, word that is used in in court. Yeah, you're right, Tim. This is like a court proceedings. Whatever you write is like a pleading, and you use these words. That's why some of these words are very familiar. And I'm happy that the 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 function of these words are similar to the words that we are using when we make a pleading. Yeah. It's very amazing, very amazing. Yeah, and it's so, 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 so team that. Go ahead. That, that every, every, every end of Apostle Paul's uh, writing, it's, it's more on what they call the epistolatry uh, petitions, like, you know, prayer, and, and then, uh, you know, he tried to exhort the, the church uh, on, on how to, to, to respond on, on the arguments of Apostle Paul. And in fact, in, in the book of James, uh, we have we have also seen that very clearly that James argued, you know, abruptly. Many, many, uh, you know, there are so much themes that that James has been arguing, and sometimes he used the word uh, in Greek terms. They, they, they call it uh, in Greek writing. They call it diatribes, uh, yeah. or catchword. He, he, yeah. he, he, he often used catchword in order to advance his his next topic. Let's say, for example. In, in, in James chapter 1, uh, verse 4, he, he used the word, so that you lack nothing. And then in verse 5, he said, if any one of you lack wisdom. So there, are, there is a, a, a catch word that, that, uh, that James is using in order to, to advance his another topic or another <laughs> argument. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. No, that's good. That's really good. I, I, I hope that the more and more we get, we get into this, the more and more, like even Sonny is giving something slightly different, the more that we study the word, the more that we get, get it. We, we should see analogies with, with our own, within our own lives, within different, both physical and spiritual. So, I, yeah, I, I just think we're just seeing and making observations of, about these different trajectories. Um, it's profound. Excellent. Excellent commentary. I like this. Okay, let's go on. We'll go for five more minutes and we'll take a break, okay? I do want to try to... I want to try to finish this so the second the second hour we can we can practice this. Okay, so moving along, I'm going to move a little bit quicker, and um, the, the the next is this idea of desire. And so this statement, uh, I'm sorry, we missed description. So let me just come back here. You could change this word to uh, characterizes, characterizes, uh, characterizes a person, place, or thing. So we we don't want to use the same word in the definition as Kuyabobo <laughs> pointed out, and uh, I stand corrected. And so yeah, let's use the word characterizes. But so, for example, I'm using James 1 8. So there we go. I have several, several examples from James, uh, not, not designed. This, is, this, is, this was not intentional, but um, he is a double, double minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so that's just a description of who this person is in the context of James, who does not have, he, he, does, he asks God but not but but not in faith or he's doubting right and so it describes who the doubting man is there's um uh, and then the description is that he's a double-minded man and he's unstable like like the waters of the sea blown by the wind uh, okay next we have here is this idea of desire 
And so this is a statement that expresses a wish or a desire. So let's just say expresses a wish. Let's not put desire in there. Expresses a wish. Or we could say or want. Wish or want. Wish or want. And so the specific example is coming from Romans 9.4. Uh, and typically you're going to see in this example here, you actually have it stated explicitly. Uh, I could wish that myself were accursed. A, a okay, so it's, this, is, this is explicit. Okay. Now it's not an action because it's not realized, all right? There is no action in, in saying you wish to do something. So that's how it, you would distinguish this from an action or some other type. It's, it's expressing something with contingency. We could include this word uh, contingency. Okay, contingency. Next, we have doxology. So we had benediction. Now we have doxology. And this is a type of prayer, right? So this is a statement that attributes glory to the person. So looking at the word, just looking at this word here, for those of you who are liking to study, this is a Greek word, um, doxes. Uh, uh, I'm going to put here. Doxa, doxa. Is it doxa? I'm going to mess this up. Doxa. Doxa, yeah. Doxa and then logos. So um, it's coming. I'm not going to write the Greek. We'll do that in Greek. I, it, it's not necessary. But uh, um, this comes from the Greek word, the Greek words for glory and then also um, word. So logos or doxa. Okay, so this is a statement that attributes glory to a person. In all of these cases, statements are directed at God generally or one of the persons of the Trinity. So uh, that's the doxology. So we have doxologies in our song hymnals that we sing. But they're also, they should be in our, our prayers as well. And really in, in scripture, they're in our prayers and also in the songs. And really there's a lot of overlap between song, singing and praying because it, it's, it's both singing and praying is direct communication with, with God. Okay, just moving along here, I'm gonna move a little bit quicker. You have entreaty, so uh, um, this is a request. So it, with entreaty, you could also have, uh, this could also be a petition. <laughs> Just, uh, just to include what Clearboy was saying. So I have entreaty here, but we could also use the word petition. So we're, uh, as Clearboy was saying, this is oftentimes in the courtroom. When we ask God, we're asking him. We could be asking him as a father or as a judge, as, as a judge as well. And so we're entreating. We're asking, we're asking a request to uh, uh, someone who is socially superior. So this could be a person, this could be a king. Uh, and of course, this is typically God himself. And so very socially superior to us, forever socially superior. There is no comparison between us and God. And then just moving along here, uh, it's already seven o'clock. So let's take, a, let's take a, a, a 10 minute break. Okay, so let's just, I wanna move quickly here. And, and uh, if you have a question, we can, we can stop, but I'll just quickly try to finish this because really it's just, we need to practice. And so uh, these should also be self-explanatory. So exclamation is just the, the, the key when you're looking for this idea of exclamation is, uh, is for an exclamation point in English. <laughs> Uh, may I ask, uh, Pastor, uh, yeah. Professor Ted, you use the word great amount of emotion. Is yeah. it really only about emotion or is it about your uh, reaction to the statement like you're in shock, you are amazed, something like that? It's not. 
can we add to your emotion the shock, the state of shock, or wonderment, or uh, bewilderment, or amazement? Can it be included? Yeah, you can include that. I mean, the big, the big idea is when you make an exclamation, there's some type of emotion connected. So it could be any form of emotion. It could be shock. Okay. Could be yeah. Shock yeah. and emotion. Yeah. So it could be anything. It could okay. be. Anything. It could be anger, it could be happiness, it could be joy, it could be sorrow, it could be shock. Okay. Yeah. It could be really anything, yeah. Just a great emotion. Thank you. You're welcome. And maybe I'll add that later when I'm revising this. But no, that, that, that I think I think we uh I think you have you have a good understanding. Knowledge, so knowledge is is a, a knowing statement. So Look at the example here. This sentence contains the content of a fact or truth. So the key in looking for a knowledge statement, you're looking for this idea of no, and then you're going to have the content of the no. What do you, what do you not, what do the Corinthian believers not know or they should know, right? It's a rhetorical question that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that's a knowing statement. That's something that we need to know, all right? So that's very important because there's a lot of these knowing statements that Jesus gives, that Paul gives, that Peter gives, that other apostles give. And so we need to identify those and then put them before the audience. Uh, possession. So possession, this is the statement that describes a person possessing or owning something. So uh, it could be ownership, it could be possession, some type of relationship. Uh, we could even say possibly a close, intimate relationship. So for example, here, Hebrews 6.19, we have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behold behind the curtain, so this is referring to Jesus. And so it's this idea that we have this sure, uh, that's in our possession, it's within us. Uh, not within us, but uh, we are connected with it. It's something that is uh, being possessed by us. The anchor is holding us in place. So, professor, can we, can we choose, can we replace the word a person possessing because we are defining possession. Can we change possessing or owning something? What's uh, the best word? So let's just do uh, ownership. It, it should be ownership. Owning. So we can think of ownership or being in someone's. What is he talking about? Custody? Custody? Yeah, no, that's good. Custody, custody. Because there's different types of possession. There's different types, right? So yeah. I own the pen, a person in someone's custody. So there's various things. So um, custody. Within a realm, it could also be a realm, yeah, or really, yeah. area. Here. Good. So, so Tim. Yeah. Um, I have questions with uh, regards to position. Does all uh, statement does that has in uh, preposition of. Uh, indicates a position or, or is there, you know, some some of the statements are not really state of position or state of position. Can you repeat your question? I, I just lost you for a minute. What was the question again? Um, my question is, um, are all statements that, that has in of or preposition of in, in a sentence uh, really, in the, uh, that's really indicates uh, um, what this one? A possessing or possession statement or really. This word of, is that what you're asking? Yes. yes. So it would be, yeah. 
it would not necessarily i wouldn't look at the word of i would i would look at the, the the key word here is this have i have a pen i have i have an anchor <laughs> who is the anchor jesus <clears throat> i have a lord so so it's more than literal possession because if i were to say i have a lord it's not that i'm possessing the lord but there is this um even close relationships a relationship of, of of inferiority but yeah so it's the key is really this uh this half that's good question very good question Okay, prohibition. Prohibition is just a negative command. So a command is to do something positively. A prohibition is to, is, is to refrain from engaging in an activity. So the example here is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10. Do not be deceived. And then, so that's that. So the negative command is don't be deceived. The prohibition is don't be deceived. So, so this is... This is the, the prohibition. <clears throat> and then what are you not to be? What is, what is this in reference to? So this is in reference to this statement. So don't be deceived. Sexually immoral idolaters, uh, idolaters, adulterers, Men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. But, but the prohibition is not to be deceived. Next we have is a promise. So promise is very important for us. It's the declaration or assurance that one will do a particular thing or that a particular thing will occur in the future. The key here is it's, it's a future tense verb and you're looking at the context, okay? So, so typically when I, when I see, see a promise, I'm looking for, uh, number one, a future tense verb. Number two, I'm looking for who is the actor? And, and then I'm just looking at the context. So, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul is offering this, uh, this pro it's a promise. Paul is offering this promise, assurance, we have this idea of you have the peace of God, you have a future tense. And so I'm looking at this and saying, this is a promise. And Paul's making the promise because he is an apostle of God himself, of the Lord Jesus. So if, if it's involving God, it's involving God's apostles or Jesus, the Lord who is God, and is a future tense, it's most likely a promise, okay? A more basic identification is you could say that this is just, some people, you know, you could say, oh, this is just a future action. Or reduce it down to action. That would not be incorrect because this is, this is an action. But it's more than an action because it's coming from God. And so we don't want to just say it's a future action. It's a future, future action and perhaps state. We want to say, no, it's a promise. We put before the people. We put before our congregation. This is a promise. Okay. <clears throat> Prophetic declaration. This is a special statement from a prophet of God that concerns the future and focuses on either salvation or judgment. 
So again, you're looking more at context here. We're looking at context, okay? And so, especially for Jesus, I, I, I look and I see this is a unique phrase. Truly, truly, I say to you, truly, truly emphasizes that this would be more, this would be adverbial. But this is emphasizing, this is for emphasis. There is a, a future. And also, this is, a, this is a future and also an ability type statement. All right? And it concerns, look at the object. This concerns salvation. Right? So you have a, Jesus is the prophet of God. So let me just add one statement here. So we also have actor is Jesus. So you have the actor who is Jesus, who is prophet. Now here's something to think about. When you're studying the word of God, when you see Jesus speaking, when you see Jesus acting, when you see Jesus, uh, uh, anything he does, some people will say, because they, they, will, they will identify Jesus as a prophet, and then, and then they'll be like, no, 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 he's more than a prophet, or they'll say he's the son of God. Uh, and so what, what often is lost is that people don't think or don't consider Jesus as the prophet of God. Maybe they think of him as Messiah, maybe they think of him as God himself, but there are three functions that Jesus, that Jesus does. He is always, we saw this in Bible's big story, prophet priest, king. In his earthly ministry, he, he, he fulfills all functions. You would say, oh, he's not really king. Uh, he's commanding the demons. <laughs> That's authority. He's teaching the people as one who has authority, not as the scribes. Okay? So he, he's doing kingly functions during his earthly ministry, okay? He's doing priestly functions during his earthly ministry. He's praying. He's forgiving sins. He's, he's leading worship services. So he's functioning as a priest. He's also functioning as prophet. He is declaring the word of God. He is the mouthpiece of God. So the people's mistake when they say Jesus is more than a prophet that's accurate, but people forget he is a prophet. <laughs> so if he's more than a prophet, it includes, it includes that category. And so we, we gloss over that. So what I want to say here is that for many things that Jesus does here, these pronouncements, uh, the prophetic woes upon Chorazin and Bethsaida, right? For their, they, woe unto you because of their unbelief, right? So so what I want us, us to see here is that this prophetic declaration, Paul will give prophetic declarations. Uh, the Old Testament prophets, for sure. Uh, Jesus does. And so we need to identify those. We need to identify those, okay? Proposition. Proposition is a statement or assertion that expresses a judgment or opinion. Now, some people would say, what's the difference between proposition and assertion? I've looked at some books, and they have, they have them as the same. And so uh, I'm including it as another example for you to consider, but perhaps there's a lot of overlap with assertion. Okay, so you look at the definition of proposition, there's different definitions. And so... I'm using proposition in this technical definition, a statement or assertion that it expresses a judgment or opinion. So in this specific example, this is different than an assertion. Paul is not, he, he's just offering an idea or a recommendation to someone. To the unmarried widows, I say that it's not good for them to remain single as I am, but it's not, 
It is not a command. It's a, it's a, it's a proposition. He's proposing it to them. Okay. Next, we have rhetorical question. A, a rhetorical request. Let, let me ask the question. When someone, what is the purpose for a rhetorical question? Yes. Ati Malagros. A rhetorical question is not a real question. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an indirect way of making a statement. <laughs> to get declaration. Yeah, great observation, Ate. So a lot of times people will ask a question and you're like, oh, it's like, it's like a dagger or it's very aggressive, right? It's not, they will not actually make their strong statement. They will present it in a question. It's less aggressive. So a rhetorical question actually, so Henry asked if we could reword. Kuya Henry, you <laughs> asked if we could reword, right? Kuya Henry, you asked if we could reword. This will be an example where you can really reword. Uh, um, <clears throat> when there's a rhetorical question and you're teaching, turn it into an assertion. Make, turn it into a statement. Turn it into a statement. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, so it is in this rhetorical question we can we can uh, reward in our course examination Steve we use that question rhetorical statement to trap to trap the witness to agree to what we would like elicit from him a certain fact or a certain uh, information all right salutation so salutation is for uh, beginning introductions of epistles so it's 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 a salutation is not a set it is a sentence in greek in english not so much but a salutation is it's the introduction of a, of a letter or epistle so typically in a salutation you'll have the author you'll have the audience and you have a greeting so those are the three if you if you if you if you see an author an audience and a greeting you know it's a salutation. Setting. Now there is overlap, so now we're kind of getting into a non-epistolary, although perhaps you could have it in a story. Uh, Kuya, Kuya. Yeah, can I ask a question before you go further? Because uh, I just want to make sure. Uh, there are epistles, usually with salutation, but uh, there are also without salutation. Could you explain the difference why there are some with, without the salutation? But Paul, uh, typically, he usually have a salutation. But others, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure they have a salutation. Similar to what Paul is saying, stating in his epistles. Is there an explanation to that? Yeah, great, great question. So the big, the big epistle that does not have a salutation is the letter to the Hebrews does not have a salutation. Most of the other letters have a salutation. First and second Peter do, James has one. Uh, first John don't have. Yes, I was gonna say first and second and third John do not have. Jude has, Jude has one. So there's different reasons for having or not having a salutation. My, my reasoning for Hebrews, this is my opinion. This is my opinion, this is not, gospel but i i believe i'm a strong believer in accordance with many in church history that paul was the writer of the letter to the hebrews and paul gives clues in the letter to the hebrews that he's the author even some very strong clues that would be like ah this is we know it's paul who's talking but he does not identify himself as the author because he, he wants his letter to be read by people that are not his friends so specifically, the Jews did not like Paul because of what he had done. And so I do think that there was, the, the, in Paul's mind, again, my interpretation, it's not gospel, but Paul was writing to, to, to Jewish Christians who were thinking about going, leaving the faith. And so he is making an apology. He's making a defense for why they should stay within the new covenant, why they should stay within Christ, in Christ's community, okay? But in writing this defense for for the church in Paul's mind and also 
he hopes that maybe those who are unbelieving Hebrews will also read it and join the church. So his primary purpose is for those Jewish Christians thinking about leaving, but also perhaps those, those Hebrews, Jewish Christians, he wants to bring them in. We, we know that throughout Acts, even though he was the Gentile to the, uh, he was the apostle to the Gentiles, he always goes to the synagogue and he reasons with the Jews. So, you know, that's my interpretation, but that would be a reason as to why he does not include a salutation. I haven't really studied why first John does not have a salutation, although it has the, the inscription of the title. And I would say that probably not having a salutation could be for, the salutation was always to benefit. So if, if the author was afraid that identifying himself would hurt the use of the letter, maybe he doesn't identify himself. That would be a reason. We don't know all the reasons as to why, um, as to why the author would not identify. Good. Let's go. Let's go. I'm running out of time. Oh my goodness. We're good. Uh, setting. So setting is dealing in a narrative story where the main characters are introduced with other important introductory information, such as location, time, and background. And so this is not so much in epistles, but it could be. And so. Uh, the example is actually Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, which is not, which is not epistolary. It's, it's, it's a story of the Old Testament. But I'm including it because, again, you have overlap, and this is an inter-sentence relationship. And so, although this mostly overlaps with epistolary genre, you could use some of these categories outside. So that's why I'm, I'm including this here as a type of sentence, because th this is a type of sentence. Um, uh, this is providing background information for a story, location, time, and other important information. So we would call that a setting. Uh, next we have is this is a state. And so the state, this sentence provides, okay, we should not. Um, now, I'm going to leave this the way it is, Koya Boboy, because I'm using this in a technical sense. The state of being is this is a, a technical phrase, especially in theology. Um, so we talk about being and what is, uh, we are becoming God, God is, is uh, we are always changing, God does not change. So I will leave that within. So the sentence provides the state of being, that's a technical uh, phrase, the state of being of a person, place, or thing. So I preempted you, Koya Boboy. <laughs> I knew you were going to ask. <laughs> no, it's good. I really, it's good. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, next we have statements. So this is a kind of action, and the statement is uh, giving us, describing us recorded speech, recorded speech. So Jesus said to her, and then there's a content. So we could also, technically, we could also identify the type of sentence within here. So this is a type of sentence, and then it's within a statement. Okay, so there's, you could do it twice, all right? But the whole kit and caboodle is a statement, all right? It's a statement. Last, we're done. Last and we're done. Uh, warning. So warning, this is a statement that cautions against carrying out an action. So there's a close co connection with, with uh, a prohibition, uh, close connection with a command, but I am, I am giving a third category for warning. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. We could say that, oh, it's, it's a command, fair enough, because there is this command idea here. But again, I, I do think there is this unique type of, it's a warning. It's really, be careful. If you say be careful, that's a warning. So um, it's not as much a command. It is, a, I mean, it is a command. I shouldn't say that. But there is this unique form of a command. You have positive command negative prohibition, then you have this warning. Um, you have a warning statement of 
being careful. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna try to go on to this next thing. We probably have to take a break again. But now, now once we've identified the different types of sentences, now we're going to look at sentence relationships. Sentence relationship. So a sentence relationships, sentence relationships are the correlation between two different sentences. So how are two sentences connected? So now we're looking at different kinds of sentence relationships. Okay, so what we have here are different kinds of sentence relationships, or we could say here, uh, we could say here types. These are types of sentence relationships. Number one, alternative. Number one, alternative. We're looking primarily at a connection between two sentences. John 4, 13 to 14. Uh, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of saints? Or do you not know that saints will judge the world? So these are two different sentences. They're providing an alternative, an alternative. The second statement provides a different solution or option in comparison to the first statement. So right now we're, 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 we're comparing these two. What is that relationship? And so we rightly identify it as an alternative. Okay, not rocket science. Uh, so sometimes it's gonna be a little more difficult, but, but sometimes it's easy. The next example is a contrast. You can have two different options. Now you can have opposing ideas. The second statement provides an adversative or contrary truth to the first statement. So now we have some key words. Uh, but in contrast to, so looking here, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. So right here, we're identifying form. And so we're making this a relationship identification. It's a contrast. It's a contrast. General to specific. So now we're moving into a, 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 the, the first statement is a generic statement or a general statement. Uh, it's a generic. I like generic better because we're not using the same word. And then the second statement provides details about the first. The difference is between a general truth or command and a specific application. So you're looking at a general idea, and then you're also giving a specific. The general command, according to 1 Timothy 4, 6 to 16, train yourself for godliness. Well, what does that look like? What's the specifics? Command and teach these things. Let no one despise your youth. Devote yourself to public reading of scripture. Do not neglect the gift you have. And so what we can see here is that there is a general command, and then there's there's specific. What does that look like specific, specifically? Give me some specifics, okay? Now here, the next example I have is greater to lesser or lesser to greater, okay? I've included these because these are relationships, but the specific examples I had was within the sentence. So I'm still thinking about how to, how to include this because it's within the sentence, okay? Or maybe a sentence type. I might change this to a type of sentence. I'm not sure yet, Let me. I need to think about that. <clears throat> but the first statement contains a lesser truth, which if true implies that the greater truth surely stands, okay? And the opposite is true. If the lesser is true, then how much more the greater? So you can go from greater to lesser or lesser to greater. Okay. So an example of this would be uh, in our life, right? If the police are giving tickets for speeding, surely the tickets, uh, if the police are giving tickets for speeding, surely the, the, the police will give a ticket for a DUI, right? 
So it's a lesser to a greater. If the police are, are giving a, 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 a traffic citation for going through the red light, and then they stop you and you are drunk, Cigarado, they're going to give you the ticket, right? Or they're going to arrest you, right? If if they're not, maybe they won't. If they're not if they're not giving out the tickets, maybe they won't give you a ticket for you know. But if, if the lesser is true, if the police are actually uh, giving the traffic citations, if they're giving the parking citations, Cigarado, they're going to give the the DUI, right? So that's the way it works. So there are many truths in Scripture where. The lesser, if the lesser is true, the greater is true. Or if the greater is true, how much more the lesser? Okay, so it works both ways. So an idea of a, an example of a lesser to the greater is in Romans 5. If God, if God reconciled, reconciled us while we were sinners, how much more will we be saved from his wrath in life? Right? So the comparison is the greater, the harder thing, the greater thing is is being reconciled to God as his enemy. Now that we are in Christ, now that we're his friends, how much more will we be saved by his life? So that's the easier thing. That's the easier thing. Is everyone tracking with me? The harder thing is having an angry God be, being brought into the relationship with an angry God. Once you're in relationship, oh, the rest is easy, right? So... Matthew 6.30 and Romans 5.10 are examples of this, okay? Idea explanation, idea explanation. Uh, this, is, this describes a relationship in which the first statement gives an idea, and then the second provides an explanation. So one is an idea, and the second is an explanation. Okay, so idea, explanation. I am somewhat setting us up for... Uh, our example, but Paul says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are also in Rome. So we could give, this could be an idea, or this could be a desire, a, de a desire. Uh, it, it actually is a desire, because eager to preach is a desire. Uh, so you would still want to identify the specific type of sentences, and then you're looking at the relationship between the two. So right now, we're just looking at you still want to identify the, the, the type of sentences. Right now, we're just looking at the, the relationship between the two, okay? So you're still going to identify this as, this is probably going to be a desire. This is probably going to be a state. But now, what's the relationship between the two? Idea, explanation, and the key. The key is this word for. Is everyone tracking with me what we're doing here? So why is Paul eager to preach the gospel? Because he's not ashamed of it, for it is the power of God for salvation. If it's the power of God, there is no shame. It's, it's, he's confident. Idea illustration. Idea illustration. The first statement is an idea. While the second statement provides an illustration to explain what is being described in the first sentence. So whereas there is an idea explanation, there's also an idea illustration. So there's going to be an idea given and then an illustration provided. Again, I don't have an example because the example that I had, I was thinking about it. I didn't like it. Maybe in a second or third edition, I will add an example. Danny looks stressed. <laughs> Again, it's a tool. It's, it's tools, I want to stress, it's tools for you to consider as you prepare. Just take one nugget here or there, just apply one or two, don't, uh, I'm, just, I'm giving you just the, the I'm giving you the, the, big, the big picture. Don't, 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 please don't be stressed. I really don't want you to be stressed. Just think of this as, I'm just, I'm providing you with various ways of thinking. Uh, and I want to emphasize, too, that prior to this, we weren't using these. So even if you were to use it one time, once a month, whatever, once a, once a year, maybe you're just going to use one category. You know, maybe you, just find, maybe you just focus on finding the promises. When you're preaching the text, you're just looking for the promises. That, that, that's it. I mean, 
any type of assistance is good, okay? I have a comment here. Let's see what the comment says. What does the chat say? Thank you for this tool, Sir Tim, because we cannot afford our sub to memorize all these two rules. So this could be a great help or great tools for us to, to navigate our our um, exegesis on, on a certain text that we want to preach. That, that's really the purpose behind it. We are, we are not, we do not have the memory. So it's, it's, it's just to help us think through these things. And yeah, so do not worry. If you're like, I'm going to fail the class now. No, no one is going to fail the class if you struggle with this. No one will fail the class. No one's going to get a bad grade, okay? You know, uh, the purpose here is not to use this to beat you. This is, this is leveling up. So my hope and prayer is just for you to even, even to get one nugget, even to find one nugget is I feel that I've, I've been successful. So I don't want anyone to be stressed, please. Uh, let's just slowly implement these. I've been using this for 10 years in my own ministry and preaching. and so. Again, sometimes I don't use this. Sometimes I don't have the time. I'm just doing whatever. So, yeah, I just really, I really want to stress. It's just put it in your bodega. Let's <laughs> say, put it in your bodega. And if ever, if ever you want to use it, you have it there. There will be no rust. <laughs> it will be ready. You, it, will, uh, it will not be eaten by the Adai. It will be there for you to use. Uh, Maybe you have to reprint it out. So save the email. Don't delete the email. <laughs> okay, moving on. Inference, inference. The second statement or sentence is the necessary effect or outcome of the previous statement. The key word is therefore. And so Romans 12.1. Therefore, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable worship. And what I want to argue here is in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verses 16, 1, 16 until 11, I think 30, 11, 11, 11, 1, 16 to 11, 36 is the basis for this radical and massive inference because of what god has done for us in christ in the gospel therefore and you even have it here the mercies of god you even have it here the mercies of god what is our response what is the inference what is the inference to the gospel present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to god which is your spiritual worship which is your spiritual worship. So it, it's an inference. It's, 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 it's a logical, uh, it's a logical or necessary effect, necessary effect or outcome from the previous statement, necessary effect or outcome from a previous statement. And, and this could be, you could say statement, or we could also say uh, context. Uh, the next we have here is list. So a list, a list is a series of statements or sentences that are given uh, in a series and have no particular order but are related in relationship to a particular topic or category. So I need to find an example of these. I haven't found one yet, but they're there. They just have like a list. So like I think in Philippians, in Colossians, there's just a list of commands to do. There's no particular order. It's surrounding general life in the church. I think the same is true in Ephesians chapter 5, chapter 4, the second half of chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 5. You just have a list of commands. You just have a list of commands, okay? There's no particular order. But it's, it, maybe they're connected around a particular topic or category. Next we have is a problem resolution. A problem resolution. So the, the first... The first statement describes a problem, and then the subsequent statement provides a resolution. So I do not have an example. Well, Romans 9.6. Look up Romans 9.6. There's a problem and there's a resolution. 
even Romans 9, 6, also, I believe, Romans, Romans 7, Romans 7, 24 to 25. This is actually a good one. I might, I might add that. That's a good one. Romans 7, 24 to 25. I'll just read it. So this is the statement. Verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So this could be a problem resolution. It also could be possibly a, a question answer. So uh, if you take if you take the who would deliver me from the body of death as a rhetorical question, really it's just making a statement. You could see this as a problem resolution. If you see it as a genuine question, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Then it could be a question answer. So those are both, but really they're similar. They're similar. It's a problem resolution. It's a question answer. It's uh, in a question you're you're dealing with the problem. So there's there's a close relationship there. Uh, we have a, a positive negative. A positive negative. So a statement provides a positive example, while the second the second provides a negative example of a particular topic. So there's a positive and a negative. A positive and a negative. We're almost done. We're, we're so close and we'll take our break. Uh, progression. So progression, each statement builds on the other as it moves towards a climax or conclusion. So each statement builds upon each other, moving towards a climax or conclusion. So this is wrong. This should not be use uh this should be and or you could say and then something like that so really in james and sonny can speak to this in james there's there's multiple statements that leave that lead towards a final conclusion right sonny i don't know if you want to chime in here it's moving towards the conclusion of uh, here we have then and so you have at least three here one two three moving towards this death conclusion now, okay so that so I actually used I used the example that I just referenced of problem resolution as a question and answer so question answer the first statement asks a question the second statement provides the answer so Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? So if you take that as a legitimate question, the, resolute, the, the, the answer is, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus. So Jesus Christ is the solution, okay? If you take, who, if you take this as a rhetorical question, then you could see this relationship as being a problem resolution. Does everyone see how the, the, the two kind of fit together? If it's a legitimate question, it can't be a problem resolution. It should be a question answer. If we're assuming that's a rhetorical question, the way you would reword it would be, wretched man that I am, no one can deliver me from the body of death, right? Ah, thanks be to God, Jesus Christ can, right? So, so it is true, no one, because we need the God man, the one and only Jesus Christ. So, so you could see this as a question answer or a problem resolution. So if I was preaching this, if I was preaching Romans 7, uh, 24 to 25, my introduction, Sigurado, my introduction would be really building this idea. In my introduction, I would be talking about how sinful we are. I'd be talking about sin, sin in our minds, sin in our actions, sin in our behavior, sin as, as individuals, sin as a family, sin as a community. And, and I would work through uh, the failure to keep the law, failure to, 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 to do things pleasing in God's sight, and, 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 and create this 
great need to then move into the resolution or the answer that it's Christ alone that can save us from the curse of death. So if you see this, if you see this interplay, if you see this interplay, it really becomes it really becomes helpful. I, I, in my introduction, if I was, I could e we could easily preach Romans 7, 24 and 25. The introduction would just be like, you ever try to do something and you just keep failing or talking about failure or, or your lack of successes? And then the first part of the sermon, point number one, would be this. Point number two would be this. Okay? So this is where, this is where, uh, this is, <laughs> structure is so important. Structure is so important, okay? It's so important. Okay, uh, just a couple more. We're almost done. Stick around and we're almost done. A restatement. So sometimes Paul will re make a restatement. In Galatians 1.9, he warns them about being a curse if they're preaching another gospel, and he says it twice. He says it twice. It's very strong. He says, I warn you. Again, I say it, if anyone is preaching another gospel than the one that I preach to you, let him be a curse. He says it twice, and a curse is the worst. I mean, it's damned. They are damned. Okay, very strong language, okay? So restatement is for effect. If you see a restatement, listen, if, you, if you're preaching a text and you see a restatement, you better be preaching, you better be preaching that statement until it dies. You better be hitting that. They, in the U.S., they say it's a, they, they, they have a saying, uh, you're beating a dead horse. <laughs> it's excessive. It's excessive. If you see a restatement by anyone, think about this, okay? We write a lot. We have paper. We have electronics. We have email. It's so easy for us to write. So, so restating something is a small thing. Ancient, ancient. Most people could not write. First century, most people cannot write. Even Paul, he has someone else write from. Okay, so most people cannot write. Number one, number two, it's mahal. It's so expensive to, to to find the utensils. You have to find a scribe to write amanuensis. It's very mahal. And then to, to to write a letter, you don't have unlimited papyri. <laughs> Limited. Okay, so for someone to restate themselves in a letter. That is very, very, very important, okay? So I want to say this right here, restatement. When you see a restatement in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the teachings of Jesus, wherever, so big, so big, okay? So just remember that. Always remember, they did not have paper. <laughs> they could not write, all right? <laughs> big. All right, moving on. Statement response, statement response. So. This isn't a dialogue. Someone makes a statement, there's a response. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's the first sentence provides uh, a statement. The second provides a response. Okay, now, I'm not going to change the word statement here because we're looking at the relationship. So we have to include statement in, in the definition. Uh, I'm preempting Queer <laughs> Momoy because he's so precise. He is, he is the the true lawyer, lawyer telling God, but we want to include statement because it is a statement in the first part, response in the second. Uh, okay, series, series is just, series is not like a progression. It's just a list without any, uh, a loose connection, but there's no climax. There's just, it's going through. So I could say, I went to the store, then I went to Robinson's, then I went to the bank, then I went to, visit the church, then I came home, right? My, my wife says, what were you doing today? You know, and I said, I went to Robinson's, I went to Burgos Auto, I went to Save More, I went to Metro Bank, and I came home. It, there, there's no climax, I'm just going through a series of events, okay? So that would be the difference between a series and a progression, okay? Lastly, I think we're almost done. We are done, last one, and we're done. Transition, so a transition is a statement that starts a new topic. So if, you're, if you see this word now, or, or uh, 
uh, it's a transitional, it's moving into a new topic. So it's not really connected to what precedes. Um, it's transitional. So Matthew 118 is an example. Ah, uh, Matt, Kuya Matt's on the line. He, I just saw his message. He agrees with Sonny, yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Kuya, that's good. 